What's wrong with benzos? Today we're going to talk about benzos, the ones that uh, the doctors don't like to prescribe, uh, which one's worse than the other benzos. And in doing so, we're going to go through quickly how benzos work, the differences between those benzos, and then the three problems that I see with the benzos and why, why we just don't like them. I'm Dr. Rob. This is uh, Straight Talk Psychiatry. Leave your comments in the uh, section below and uh, let's get to it. So when we take benzodiazepines, what we're really modulating, what we're really affecting is the GABA receptor. And the GABA receptor is responsible for calming the excitability of the nerves down. This first little diagram here doesn't talk about uh, the benzos themselves. It kind of gives you a, a diagram of GABA itself. GABA is the neurotransmitter that cools down the, 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 nerve, the nervous response by affecting the GABA receptor. GABA, the molecule in this diagram, is black. these black dots, and they are in that pink little vacuole. Uh, that, that blue nerve then is going to try to be the talking nerve and the purple nerve is going to be the listening nerve. And those pink vacuoles then are moved to the edge of the nerve. The black GABA uh, molecules get shot out in between the space, uh, in between those two nerves. And then those black GABA molecules bind to the, uh, and in, in this diagram, it's five white oval uh, ovals clustered together. That's the GABA receptor. Once the GABA binds to the receptor, the receptor uh, changes its form and shifts a little bit, and it allows a chloride molecule to go through, uh, the, or a chloride ion. When chloride goes into the cell, it makes the cell, it makes the nerve less excitable. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the... Uh, physiology there, uh, why that works, but um, that's ultimately what's going on when we affect those receptors. When we take benzodiazepines, when they're prescribed, we're working on the same exact receptor. Di a little bit different place on the receptor, but it works essentially the same way. And so here we can see the benzodiazepine uh, fitting into the little square, square slot, just like GABA fits into the circle slot there. And then you'll also notice that ethanol, alcohol, that affects the GABA receptor the same way or nearly th the same way. So yes, when you're taking benzodiazepines, you're essentially getting a prescription alcohol. Uh, and, and the effect is ultimately on the same receptor for the same purpose of calming down the excitability of the nerve and helping with uh, anxiety or to relieve uh, anxiety and panic attacks. This slide here is just to kind of give you a, a brief overview of all the different types of benzodiazepines. And what I'm really trying to focus most on this is there is a stark difference between the rate of onset. So the, the how fast something, uh, how fast one of these benzodiazepines actually kick in, and then the duration of action off on the left-hand column. So if you're somebody who's panicky and you're, if you, and you're in an excited state and you're trying to calm down, you don't like being in that panic state for very long. And for that reason, you're probably going to want something that hits fast because you don't want to be hitting a, having a panic attack for 20, 30 minutes. On the other hand, the duration on the left-hand column, we've got everything from 4 to 15 uh, hours uh, and the, the big one that I'm going to talk about is uh, Xanax, 6 to 12 hours, and clonazepam. Clonazepam is a, a, a slow onset medicine, but it lasts a good 18 to 50 hours, depending on how sensitive you are to the medication. Uh, and so when we prescribe benzodiazepines, there, there is a wide variety in the efficacy of some of these uh, some of these benzos. And that's why some people will definitely not feel as big of a punch or a kick, uh, particularly with, uh, with Xanax uh, or, or with uh, clonazepam. People will 
it, if they're chronically on benzos, they're going to want Xanax because it hits harder. But there's a problem to that, and we're going to get into that in just a second. Uh, this is another uh, quick slide about just the half-life of the benzodiazepines. Half-life meaning uh, roughly how long it takes for half of the of the medication to leave your bloodstream. And there is wide variability there. Um, even for Alprazolam, even for Xanax, it's six to 12 hours, um, which is a pretty good healthy, healthy difference. This is a quick diagram showing the ups and downs of Xanax. Uh, Xanax, the instant release are the circles, uh, the, the, the uh, line drawn out with the circles. Xanax can be prescribed four times a day. And the reason being is because of that quick onset and then short half-life. So it goes up, but then it comes down. Just a few hours later, you're kind of back into your, uh, potentially back into your anxiety state. So you pop another one and you go back up and then you're back down. And so four times a day, if you're in a constant state of anxiety or <clears throat> panicky, panicky state, that's why you see people popping Xanax pills so frequently is because it's up and down and up and down. It's on and off, on and off. It's almost like a light switch. The problem with Xanax, the problem with benzos, uh, at least the first one, is withdrawal. Temporary use of benzos, that can be an okay thing. Uh, for a very specific need for short periods of time, that can be an okay thing. But if you're chronically on opiates, just like if you're chronically drinking alcohol, people will have issues with withdrawal. And this diagram here shows the different uh, paths that people will take depending on what chronic benzo they're on. Notice all the way to the left, there is a high spike and then it comes down quickly. And that's specifically with the withdrawal from short half-life benzodiazepines. And we'll just say that's the Xanax curve. Off onto the y, um, uh, y axis there, the severity of the signs and symptoms peaks higher and higher with those short half-life benzos because they're also usually the ones that hit harder. And so when they come off, they, they come off harder as well. Those are the those are the people that are going to be more likely to have uh, problems with complicated withdrawal, complicated withdrawal being seizures, and much much more difficult time with uh, shaking and uh, confusion and having a super excited state. Usually, yeah, it's about one to two weeks that you can be feeling those those symptoms overall. But don't fool yourself; there is a prolonged withdrawal that can happen with any of the benzos and make you not feel so good for a long time after you're coming off of your benzos if you've been on them chronically. So withdrawal is one of those issues. But on top of the withdrawal, there's the second problem, which is worsening of anxiety. Um, we, we, we do know um, that when you mess with the GABA receptors and you change them a little bit, there's a more excitability factor to the to the neurons. We already know that there's a correlation between epilepsy, people that have seizures, and the uh, GABA receptor mutations. We also know that people that are on chronic benzos have shown to have changes in their GABA receptor subtypes. Uh, and that's its own uh, ball of wax and a big, big set of weeds that I'm not going to go on, uh, go on to right now. But we do know that those receptors change. And if they're not acting the way that they should be acting, they can, they can be much more, uh, they can cause the, the nerves to be much more excitable. And so knowing that those chronic benzo users uh, can have a change in their GABA receptors and their subtypes, the hypothesis, uh, uh, there's a clear hypothesis and link there that that's why we think that many people, when they come off of their, their chronic uh, benzo usage, they're more excited. The nerves are more excited. They have a, they're, they're, even times, plenty of patients will say that I feel worse off than when I first started the, the benzos in the first place. And that's the anxiety. So second problem, 
worse anxiety. Why? There's, there seems to be some mechanism that can change the subtype of your um, GABA receptors. Not everybody, not always, but some people. The third problem is relapse and overdose. Relapse and overdose, uh, you know, if, if you can imagine a state where you're, you have withdrawals when you come off of your benzos, if you can imagine a state where when you come off your benzos and you're not dealing with the withdrawal part anymore, but your baseline anxiety is that much higher, people will relapse. People will relapse uh, and, and use those benzos more frequently and harder. Uh, they'll go back to using high doses that may, they may have been on in the past. That's where you get into situations of an overdose. And if you put all those thing, three things together that from the outside looking in, that's where uh, physicians and society as a whole will say, well, that person's addicted to benzos. And then really, I'm not even talking about um, the implicit uh, abuse of the benzos, you know, the, the, the aspect where people deliberately go out and seek those benzos to get high, which certainly you can, just like anybody can get uh, uh, a fulfillment out of drinking too much alcohol. Um, but I'm not even talking about that part of addiction. I'm talking about just the inherent effects of the one, two, and uh, problem one, two, and three that you there you have withdrawal, that you can have a, actually a worsening of your baseline anxiety if you're on it long enough, and then on top of that, um, you can overdose and relapse. So that is, in a nutshell. Um, why we don't necessarily like benzos, but then Xanax and in, in, uh, even more so because of the sharp up and downs, the sharp uh, peaks and valleys of when you pop four benzos a day. And then you, uh, you uh, hear people getting prescriptions for 120 or more pills at a time. Uh, that's how it happens. And it's not necessarily their fault. Uh, it's, it's how the medicine was designed. And so we have to be very, very careful with those medications. The last little question there is, so should they be used at all? Because I kind of paint a really not so good picture of the benzos and for good reason, but should they not be used at all? Um, I, I still think they should be used, but they need to be used appropriately. Uh, when, when we see patients in clinic, um, you know, there, there is a difference between somebody who's going through a rough patch of anxiety and somebody who's absolutely debilitated by their uh, current state of panic and can't get out, you know, they, they can't leave their house kind of a thing. Like that, that's a, that's a problem and that's pathologic in itself. And it's weighing the risks and benefits for each individual. And so we, we, that they definitely should be used in the appropriate settings, but they have to be used with extreme caution. And if you have any questions about that or comments, put the uh, put those comments and questions in the uh, in the comment section, and we'll try to answer them. There's a couple other questions or comments that people have uh, made over the last week. Uh, this one was by Natalie. Uh, said, "Hi, dear. Uh, today I went to the psychiatrist in Paris for my." Trichotillomania, uh, he prescribed one milligram of risperidone. What do you think? Uh, this one, this one I had to go look up. Um, I wasn't really aware of any medication management for uh, trichotillomania. Trichotillomania is where you're uh, pulling your own hair. It's something that, uh, it's, a, it's a behavioral issue. And you end up wearing a bald spot in your head. It's kind of a self-induced alopecia. Um, the, the things that have been known to be effective for trichotillomania is really cognitive therapy and behavioral therapy. Um, but then in looking it up and reading some, uh, some articles on Mayo, there are, if, you, if there's a comorbid condition where you're trying to um, treat the comorbid condition with, with medication, that would make sense. Uh, like if there's a, a clear depression or anxiety or a uh, compulsion, um, then yeah, you can, you can try medications. SSRIs are commonly used, but then, uh, they did mention that, um, uh, every once in a while, some people, some prescribers will use antipsychotics for trichotillomania. I'm not entirely sure what the mechanism is there, or what the thought process is there, 
um, but it does seem to be used occasionally. Um, it just kind of depends on your situation and what, what you're looking to achieve. Is it really for the behavior? Probably not, but probably more so trying to help treat some other comorbid diagnosis. Uh, this one was from uh, Mike. Uh, Mike was talking about um, his anxiety and that he was on Lexapro and that one wasn't so good for him and Zoloft worked uh, quite a bit better. Um, just started abuse bar and he was hoping that that one would give him a, a happy medium and, and be effective without giving him side effects. Uh, and then he asked, you know, is abuse bar pretty good when trying to reduce worry? And that, that was kind of a interesting question the way that you he worded it there because i mean yeah abuse bar is used for um anxiety and it is it, it works very very well it's one of my more favorite medications because of the more favorable side effect profile uh, i i don't see people in clinic with side effects abuse bar nearly as much as i do from other ssri medications like he alludes to with the lexapro and the zoloft uh, so yeah, will use bar work with the anxiety? Yes, but also don't fool yourself. If you're talking about just, if you're talking about specific thoughts or worries that, you know, that just keep in mind, these medicines are hopefully helping you control the overall anxiety level or, or, or just tone down the overall noise so that you can process your thoughts better. It's not going to make your situation different. It's not going to change your day-to-day -day life. It's not going to change how you wake up and how you go to work and the stresses uh, that you have from point A to point B. Uh, but hopefully it does help you cool down the intensity of those thoughts so that you can process them better. And that's also to the point of uh, what I wanted to say there. That's why it has really been proven that the best efficacy for anxiety, for depression, it's not just medication management, it's a combination of the medication management with, uh, with therapy. And if you're not working on the therapy side and you're just hoping that the pill makes all that other stuff go away, that's, that's, that's only half the picture uh, or potentially only half the picture if the medicine is working well for you to tone down the intensity of your thoughts. So uh, is Buse bar pretty good? Yes, I think Buse bar is pretty good. Um, is it going to get rid of the worry altogether? No, no, it's not going to get rid of the the position that you're in it in life. Uh, but hopefully, you can process those thoughts a little bit better. Uh, this one's from LS Palm. Uh, I went back on it. It being Prozac uh, three days ago, twenty milligrams. After not taking it for 20-ish years, uh, does your body create receptors in the brain for it? I was having a heightened sense of anxiety yesterday. Now, today, so far, a lot more even even, uh, even feeling than yesterday. Uh, short answer for the first part, no. Your your body does not create receptors for the, for the Prozac. Uh, we could do a um, mechanism of action, uh, video on, on Prozac and just the SSRIs in general. Cause, uh, we got a lot of videos on SSRIs, but I don't think we have a full blown mechanism of action that we can talk about. Um, but no, it does not create receptors for the medicine. Um, two thoughts though, about having the anxiety one, you haven't been on the medicine for a while. So you might be having uh, short term, uh, side effects. And with any of these, SSRI medicines, there's a couple different types of side effect profiles. There's the dose dependent side effect and then the time dependent side effect. For most of the SSRIs, people will get a time dependent side effect for the first couple of weeks. Uh, if there's going to be side effects, they'll peak out and then slowly ramp down. Uh, the longer you're on the medicine, the more likely those side effects are to go away. Uh, if you're having a dose dependent side effect, it really doesn't matter how long you take the medicine. If you continue to take the medicine, you're going to continue to get the side effect. So if you had a not so good day uh, with anxiety, uh, a, a heightened sense of anxiety uh, for the first couple of days, that does make sense. That is a relatively common side effect for Prozac or really any of the SSRI medications. Uh, but that does generally wane away. Um, and because you're feeling better, I would I would expect that 
uh, anxiety feeling to not really come back. The other thought was, is maybe you didn't experience that from 20 years ago uh, or when you first started taking the medicine 20 years ago. Um, keep in mind that 20 years is a good amount of time and your body is different than it was 20 years ago. And I will s routinely see people in clinic that have tolerated medicines that they've been on for a long, long time. But as their body changes, as their metabolism changes, so does the effect uh, of those medications on their body. And, and so that includes the side effect profiles. So uh, being 20 years, a little more experienced in age now, you might end up feeling or seeing side effects that you never actually saw with that medication from 20 years ago. And then the last one that I got here is from Finity. Um, the first question at the bottom there was uh, talking about, is there some ADHD medications to help with depression? And, and if so, which ones? Uh, and then mentioned uh, just a short time later that he, uh, this person was on Vyvanse 60 milligrams, not feeling much from benefits. What would you say is a good switch to? Uh, you know, switch to which medication that would might be better. Thinking about going on Concerta or Ritalin, but I do suspect I have some depression and low motivation as well. So uh, to the first point there, yeah, there are stimulant medications that we prescribe for ADHD that are occasionally prescribed for uh, refractory depression or, or depression that is... Um, uh, not managed with typical S uh, or not typical um, responses to SSRIs, uh, still having debilitating depression. Um, the types of people that really don't actually get out of bed that have uh, that is this persistent uh, debilitating uh, low mood has uh, uh, anhedonia, no, no motivation uh, is certainly a, a piece of uh, depression. It's not super commonly used, though, um, because you can get into issues with the side effect profiles of, of stimulants, which, yeah, when you take a stimulant, it will stimulate you to feel good and can help drive people out of depression. Um, you know, me being a primary care provider, I don't think I would ever get into a situation where I would be prescribing the, the um, stimulant type medications for the purpose of helping people with uh, this uh, depression that is um, just totally non-responsive. Uh, there are a couple of other options that are used. I mean, you, this person commented on the, on the shrooms video, um, and certainly we can't recommend that. That's not a, an approved thing, at least not yet. Um, but there are options for this refractory depression, this uh, non-responsive depression uh, with ketamine. And we do have a video on ketamine. Finding a, a, a prescriber for ketamine infusions might be a little difficult, but that is an option. Uh, and then uh, something that we haven't made a video on was um, electroconvulsive uh, therapy or ECT. And that's something that I didn't witness, but Allie witnessed uh, firsthand uh, up at the University of Iowa. Um, and that was um, kind of eye-opening because it was a it was a very neat experience for her. She she loves seeing that stuff, and more importantly, the effect that it had on patients. The p patients would really have a phenomenal, uh, robust response from it if adequately diagnosed. Um, so those are a couple other options. But yes, Vi Vyvanse being a uh, more of a extended release stimulant option is. Uh, sometimes used in the in the clinical setting for uh, non-responsive depression. And I wish you the best on that. I hope that works out well for you. Um, but as far as bouncing from side uh, um, from stimulant to stimulant, um, th that that's that's definitely one between you and your uh, prescriber. If you're not seeing, uh, a marked improvement in the symptoms that you're describing. You can try other stimulants with you and your other prescriber, but you might also want to be looking for other other options uh, as far as helping you with that with that depression. So that is all the 
questions that I had from last week that I didn't uh, respond to uh, or, or Allie didn't respond to. Um, some some really good, interesting questions. Um, next week, then, uh, just because of this other uh, question about Prozac and the mechanism there, I think we'll make a, a video on the mechanism of uh, SSRI medications and uh, go from there. So leave your questions and comments in the in the comments section, and we're going to get to those next week. Have a good day.